Welcome to the Actual Astronomy Podcast episode, and I'll get it right this time, episode 19. Woohoo! Is that right? That is right. Okay, perfect. So, uh, Wendy, welcome to the Actual Astronomy Podcast, the podcast by amateur astronomers for amateur astronomers and people who like to look at the stars, plants, and generally investigate the universe for themselves. How was your week, Shane? Windy, windy, windy. How was yours? Exactly. I feel like we should talk about atmospheric scene today, maybe a little bit later. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm good with that. It kind of, uh, it's timely with this wind. Yeah, good stuff. I hear you tracked down a pretty, actually a couple rare eyepieces. I did. Monocentrics, monocentrics. Tell us about monocentrics. Well, um, so a monocentric eyepiece talks about the, like the design of it. And I'm, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not well versed on, on that side of it. Um, I, like, I don't know if they're all the same. These monocentrics, so the, these are TMB monocentrics, uh, are three elements um, that are cemented together and are renowned for uh, really good contrast. Uh, so, you know, great for planetary observing. Uh, but they're also renowned for an extremely narrow field of view. Um, these wait. are about 30 degrees. I thought it was all about getting like a hundred plus degree field of view eyepieces these days. You know, for some people <laughs> it is. Yeah, you're right. Um, but here's myself, my widest field eyepieces that I've typically used are panoptics, which I think are like 68 or 70 degrees field of view. And um, when I picked up that Nagler, which is, I don't know, 80 or 82, um, you know, it's impressive how wide it is and how flat the field, you know, it's, wonderful oh, yeah. it's but nice, when, yeah. exactly. when you have to move your eyeball around to observe the whole field it just seems crazy to me <laughs> i i'm i think i'm a little bit rare but i kind of like to see the field stop of the eyepiece i like to i like to have a little bit of a barrel view i don't know yeah. it's just to me that's what's right <laughs> yeah well, i find i'm somebody who needs to wear glasses when i observe so anything much beyond that uh you know 70 odd degree field of view is uh is an eyepiece that generally i can't really use that well anyway and I remember the ethos came out and i was so excited and tom trusick from clyde and eight's beam was uh uh was out with uh, i think 13 and actually he had the uh the teleview 101 that you have uh, the Genesis. I, th I think that's what it was anyway. He had the 13 ethos in that. And I was so excited. And I go up and look through it. And I'm like, I can only see like 70 odd degrees. What's going on? And it, yeah, of course, because with the, uh, with the glasses on, oh no, you have to take your glasses off. Well, okay. And I look in and everything's astigmatic, right? So mm -hmm. that's so good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and short eye relief on those ethos as well, I believe 10 millimeters or something like yeah. that. Yeah. The monocentrics also have short eye relief too, I believe, though. They do. What's interesting is uh, I've read a number of reports that talk about the eye relief, you know, uh, ad is advertised similar to what like orthoscopics and plossils are. But most or many observers that have looked through the TMB monocentrics uh, report that they're far more comfortable than any, any orthos or plossils in that focal length. So kind of curious to see how that is and how it feels. Um, certainly you can't wear eyeglasses, uh, at least with the focal lengths that I got, which is four millimeter and five millimeter, uh, eyeglasses will be pretty tough to, to wear. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be, are you going to put them on a tracking mount or, or in the telescope on the tracking mount or? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. With that kind of magnification, uh, and that narrow of a field of view, um, I think a tracking mount will be 100% required. At least for the planets, if I was to maybe look at clusters or, you know, some deep sky objects, um, you know, I probably could get away with just your standard uh, non-tracking mount. Yeah, I found with my uh, Pentax 5.1 XO, it, it is a very comfortable field um, to actually look at. So unlike other eyepieces that, that I've had that were similarly high powered that maybe even have better eye relief, uh, they can be more difficult to look through versus some of these uh, really well-designed short focal length, those short eye relief uh, can actually have reasonable comfort to them. Yeah. Yeah. So they should arrive this week, um, which gives me ample time to test them out and then use them for the rest of this, the planetary season that we have coming up in front of us. Yeah. And we talked about some pretty good planet opportunities in the uh, June, 2020 
book to observe the night sky podcast. So I'll, I'll refer you to that. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> but you'll have to get up early to observe Shane. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I got a soft case this week from newer, which is a pretty inexpensive uh, little soft case. I just kind of wanted to clean up uh, a lot of my extra eyepieces and hardware that's around, but it needs some more of those. It's one of those ones that's really made for um, camera lenses and for a camera. And so I need to get some more of these dividers with, with like the, the padding and the Velcro. I think I need about five or six more dividers, I think. Oh, okay. So, so is this a backpack or, or what, what no, is this? It's just like a little case. Yeah, I think Explore Scientific makes one with, with enough dividers. And, and I, I thought I would maybe need one or two and I kind of have a couple extra, but I need a lot more than that. So I kind of probably should have sprung for the uh, Explore Scientific one, but I think it was twice as much. And I, I just wasn't really, uh, I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to go with a soft case or not. So. I'm not really sure about this purchase, actually. <laughs> anyway, it was one of those things. It looks nice. Well, you never know till you try it, I guess. Yeah. What are you going to put your monocentrics in when they arrive? Uh, like for storage or telescope? Uh, for storage. China cabinet, display case. <laughs> uh, yeah, vault. <laughs> um, I'm not too sure, actually. I'm I'm actually, it's funny how you and I go through some of these things at the same time without even talking to each other, but I'm kind of rethinking my IP storage at the moment as well. Um, yeah. uh, you know, it would be nice to have something that, you know, safely holds and stores the eyepieces that I would use the most, um, but would also be somewhat modular, you know, because when we go to our dark sky sites, I, you know, I'm probably never going to use uh, high powered eyepieces. You know, it's usually right. lower wide field, lower power wide field eyepieces. So I don't right. need to take my whole collection. Uh, so it would be nice if I could just take, you know, the two or three kind of wide field eyepieces and away I go. But, yeah. you know, if I'm in the backyard doing planetary work, I probably want actually a lot of eyepieces um, because depending on the seeing or how good the atmosphere is, which we'll probably get into in a little more detail, um, you're, you're at least myself when I'm looking at the planets, I want to use as much power as the atmosphere will allow me to use. Um, mm -hmm. So you keep incrementing by, you know, one millimeter if you can, especially at the higher powers uh, until the image breaks down a little bit. And uh, so for planetary stuff, I'd like to have a little case where I, you know, have quite a few of these eyepieces to do that. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I think these soft cases are a good idea. Um, you know, the Explore Scientific one definitely, yeah, if, if they, if, if it has more dividers and it's similar to this, and I, I think it is, I think it's basically like a branded version of what I bought. Um, that might be the way to go because it's got quite a few slots. It's pretty light. And it is uh, customizable. I think you can put quite a few eyepieces in it, and it doesn't weigh very much. So, kind of ticks a lot of boxes. Like what I want, yeah, like you were saying, is just a, basically a case where I can put most of my eyepieces in it. And then when I'm going somewhere uh, really dark where we're going to travel out, I'm really only going to use like say my forty, my twelve and a half, my seven, and a five. Right? I still need to buy a five. So that's just four eyepieces, my diagonal um, filters. Um, you know, so I only need like six, seven slots, something like that. Um, I don't need, uh, I don't need to be hauling everything with me. So I kind of just want to be able to pull, you know, the ones I'm not using out, but I have like all kinds of eyepieces, like some of those vintage Spears Waller, like very rare, like 12.1 and a, and a ancient zoom and things like that, that I just kind of want to keep, but they're just kind of like kicking around in places. And like, I'm sitting here in my office and I got like, eyepiece case like there's an eyepiece case everywhere i sit there's one by the sofa there's one, like they're just all over the place you probably live in a similar situation so i do you know over the years you you buy eyepieces you use them you replace them some you sell some you keep and you know over time you do end up with you know a bit of a collection yeah yeah cool so right now i'm finishing up my venus article for the resc journal which i think it comes out in like august or something like that as as part of uh my venus observation wrap up for the greatest eastern elongation before starting the greatest uh western elongation uh, of venus and uh, mars observations i think someone's actually going to write the mars observing article which i had in mind so that's great so i did the venus and someone's going to do 
uh, Mars. It'd be great if I can get somebody on for like Jupiter and Saturn and do like a whole series of, of planetary observing articles. But right now I'm actually reading chapter five, The Himalayans of Venus by Richard Baum in his book, The Haunted Observatory, uh, which is pretty cool. It's, it's a good book. It's, it's sort of like an academic book for visual observers uh, who have an interest in uh, the planets and other things. Uh, and covers a lot of controversial topics uh, surrounding astronomers from, I think, just about around the time of the Galileo uh, first observations into about the mid 20th century or something like that. Oh, that sounds very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a neat book. I have I have a copy. So uh, unfortunately, uh, Richard Baum died a, a few years ago, um, but uh, a friend. Uh, that I have uh, was a friend of his, and, and I have like a pre-published uh, version. I think he got for free and sent me. So I have that sitting here. Um, it's sort of weird to read. It's like it's a little book, but it's extremely heavy. It weighs like two or three pounds. So I was like, trying to read it in bed, and like because you get a hold of it up, and it's sort of been like like I kind of to sit at a desk and read it. It's very it feels very academic, and the the paper is this very strange quality. So I got like a little bit of water on it. Just like a drop of water has pretty much like destroyed a whole page down to this, this pre-print copy at one time read, I guess, kind of thing. So uh, <laughs> quite interesting. So I'm also reading um, visual I, this, this article by a guy named uh, Odwin Dolphus um, from, from the Picomini Observatory in France. And, and he, wrote a, he wrote a book called The Atlas of the Planets with a guy named Calais back uh, in the 60s, my copy was published in 67. But just prior to that, he wrote this uh, this article, which is freely available online, called Visual and Photographic Studies of Planets at the Pictomini Observatory. And the Pictomini Observatory is this observatory, um, I think it's in the French Alps or the Pyrenees or whatever. Um, and it's up pretty high, I think like 11 or 14,000 feet. It's way up high in the mountains. You have to, people take a cable car up there and go sightseeing and stuff. But then there's also this observatory. And he details a variety of really interesting facets of observing. And one of them is seeing conditions. <laughs> so he talks about using large telescopes uh, and their visual range like what it's actually like to look through large telescopes, which typically uh, professional astronomers haven't really written about that much, but he actually writes about this uh, and he did lots of visual observing through these, these really big instruments. And he goes into great detail uh, about how astronomical seeing impacts the telescopes. It goes into this whole big section on how to rate seeing conditions and um, you know, why the seeing conditions are really good there, of course, they're way up on top of this mountain. Um, but then he also talks, and this is, this is the thing I found super interesting. So this item he covers is uh, the business of using a one millimeter exit pupil. So what, what is the exit pupil that we're, that we're talking about when we say exit pupil at a telescope? Oh, I always forget this formula. Uh, so, you'll have to enlighten us. It's fine. So, so what the eggs pupil is, it's just the size of the light cone that's coming out of the eyepiece of the telescope. And it's very easy to, to figure out that, uh, so for example, if you have an F6 telescope and you want a one millimeter, and this is one of the other cool things that makes it super easy to talk about, if you want a one millimeter eggs of pupil, use a six millimeter eyepiece, okay? So no matter how big or small the telescope is, my uh, 60 millimeter is, let's just say it's F6. Um, and if I want a one millimeter eggs of people, I take a six millimeter eyepiece, I put it on, I got a one millimeter eggs of people. If you got an eight inch F6, it's a very common telescope. You want that one millimeter eggs of people, you just get a six millimeter eyepiece. Now, in my telescope, my 60 millimeter, it's just going to give me 60 magnification on a 60 millimeter telescope. On the eight inch, 200 millimeter telescope, roughly, it's going to give you 200 power. Okay, so um, let's see. And he says that observers should not go above, no larger than a one millimeter, eggs pupil, uh, and not really below by very much at all. And this was actually something I recently was reading about by amateur astronomer and author of choosing and using astronomical eyepieces, Bill uh, Paolini on Cloudy Nights, probably saying his name wrong. 
um, where he states running experiment using small telescopes and he determined that you should use between one and 0.7 millimeters as the ideal exit pupil uh, for telescopes. So Shane, hmm. I'm not gonna give you any more math because I already did the math for you. I did, didn't want to like spring any of this on you. And I know it's like, it's, it's difficult. We're doing this live without any real notes or anything, very, very brief notes. Um, so in your 76 millimeter, which is an F 7.5, a yep. one millimeter X pupil is gonna give you 76 power. So the closest eyepiece that's gonna give you that 0 0.7 is gonna be a uh, five millimeter. And that's gonna give you about 109 power, all right? Okay. So you're looking at something between, well, basically if you use a, uh, a 7.6 or something like a seven millimeter, that's gonna give you just over that uh, 75 power on your telescope. I think maybe like 80 something, low 80s, that would okay. be nice. Yep. And then you have the other one sort of to bracket on the other end. And what they say is that if you go above it, although the one thing that you get, and you can push the smaller scopes a little bit more, uh, but the one thing you get particularly on larger instruments is the loss of contrast. Hmm. And of course, with our refractors being uh, basically contrast machines, um, we can kind of kind of go a little bit higher. Um, but I've kind of noticed this as well with instruments. Like I noticed on my 125, which I've done a lot of planetary observing, I say probably most of my planetary observing has been done with my five inch apocromat. Um, yeah, like I've noticed that really that sort of 0.7 into that kind of 170-ish range is really a sweet spot when the seeing uh, permits. With my 100 that I just bought, I'm looking at 100, mil 100 millimeter telescope so a one millimeter angst for people means using, you know, about a hundred power. It's a 7.4 F ratio. So I'm using a seven millimeter that gives me 105, which is close enough. And then at the top end, uh, 0.7 would be 150 or so. And with, uh, with this telescope, I would use a five. So that's going to be 148 power. Um, and that seems, and when I did a lot of digging around, I found that 150 power, on a four inch telescope is, uh, is, is pretty common. Most people say that on a four inch, they're getting their best views at about 150 power between like say 140 something and, and say 180 something is, is sort of the sweet spot. So it kind of jives with what, uh, with what people are mentioning. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Um, so I guess if you were to start matching eyepieces, uh, you know, to the focal length of your telescope to achieve a certain exit people. Um, and if you have, <clears throat> excuse me, multiple telescopes, I guess that it's sort of advantageous to have multiple telescopes around the same focal length to prevent you from having to, to buy a whole bunch of eyepieces. Yeah, it's kind of neat. And, and uh, Dolphus talks about this. So he talks about having, I think he was using a 60 centimeter uh, telescope. Um, so that would be uh, two foot, so like a 24 inch. I, I feel like, boy, for some reason, I can't remember if it was a refractor or a reflector, but regardless, what he talks about though is, <coughs> is still keeping this one millimeter exit pupil um, and then masking down uh, the telescope and then changing eyepieces to match it. So uh, let's say that he's using one eyepiece and he's using the full 60 centimeter aperture of the instrument, okay? So maybe the eyepiece uh, that he's using, um, maybe at that, it, it, maybe it's like an F20 at that point, okay? So he's using a 20 millimeter eyepiece um, when it's at the full 60 centimeter aperture. But then what he says he does is they stop it down. So, if, so let's just say, and I'm just pulling numbers out of the air here. They stop it down to 30 centimeters. Then he's gonna go and he's gonna get a 40 millimeter eyepiece because he wants to still keep it. Because of course, if you cut it, uh, the aperture in half, you're increasing your focal ratio uh, by two, right? So you go from having, say, if it was an F20, um, 24 inch refractor, you're going to go to have a 12 inch F40 refractor. Uh, so in order to kind of keep that one million exit people, um, you need to kind of switch eyepieces that, that way. But what's interesting, kind of what really got me thinking about this is, is in the, in the last uh, episode that we recorded, um, we talked about making that observation of, uh, of uh, Venus um, 
as it was doing the, the transit back in 2012. And what I did at that time is I had different aperture stops. And I noticed that as I was observing, I, I wanted to have more. I had some of my eyepieces with me, but I really wanted to have more. And I could never figure out why I wanted to switch eyepieces around so much. So I think like even um, as an observer in the field, uh, using that kind of uh, technique could, could prove uh, pretty beneficial. So even with, um, you know, like I know with your five inch, you could maybe try this sometime. Uh, I'm certainly going to try it a little bit more. I never really took using aperture stops so seriously, but instead of, I think, I think the, the method to the madness in this is that instead of necessarily trying to pair the eyepiece with the seeing, what you do is you pair the telescope with the seeing and then use the appropriate eyepiece to give you one millimeter. You see what I mean? I never really thought about it like that before. Yeah, very different approach. So with a hundred millimeter, let's say I go out, I should be able to get, I feel like I should be able to get a hundred power most nights though, right? I would hope so. Like to me, if you can't get a hundred power, it's, it's probably not a great night to be observing. Right, exactly. So with my, with our small telescopes, like with yours, when we were talking there, where where that sweet spot is between uh, 76 odd and around 110 power, you might be able to get a little bit more out of it. With mine, the sweet spot's gonna be between 100 and, uh, and about 150. Um, and then with the with the five inch though, here's the thing, is with a five inch, your sweet spot starts at 125 and it's gonna run up to into the 180s or so. But there are times where you can't quite, like the other night I was at observing Venus and I couldn't quite do 125. Now I was just using the five inch, or sorry, the four inch. But if I was using the five inch that night, I might've backed the power off and still had what I would have thought was um, poor seeing and loss of contrast because I can't run the power as high. But in that instance, what I ought to do is mass down to about a hundred millimeters using like a seven and a half millimeter eyepiece. That telescope is a 750 millimeter focal length F6. So I want to use like, you know, an eyepiece that's going to give me that hundred power, uh, but mask it down, take an inch off the aperture. Hmm. And then so then why wouldn't you just want to use your four inch in that case? Well, in that case, I will use my four inch. This is one of the reasons why I bought the four inch in the first place, because I was right. finding actually, and, and maybe to make a long, maybe I'm making a long story short now without, without realizing it, is that uh, that's one of the reasons why I think I bought the four inch was that I was experiencing this quite a bit where on sort of those those worst nights, I wasn't able to to hit that sweet spot, and I was running into uh, some other difficulties with the five. Like for example, cool down the telescope waist twice um, with the four inch I bought ways. So I was running into some of these things and really struggling with why I was so driven to get a to get a really good four inch telescope when I've already got uh, this five inch instrument um, as well as my sixty. And then I like the fact that I have the sixty, which again, like I can run with a with a, a six millimeter eyepiece and get uh, around 60 power. And really that telescope does, I don't seem to lose much contrast until I get into about a hundred power. And then I do notice that I do lose the contrast after about a hundred power, which, which is around that 0.7 millimeter uh, execute again. So anyway, that's kind of what I've been uh, <laughs> researching and looking at this week. <laughs> so then if we stick with that topic of exit pupil, is there recommended exit pupils for not just maximum power, but uh, like, you know, medium and low power? Yeah, there is. So if you're looking for uh, low power, I think probably what we're doing here is we're splitting into high and low power. Medium power is just anything that's going to fall in, in between. And then that's just going to be medium power. But kind of the way the eye performs is that on, on the higher end and the lower end, you're going to you're going to gain and lose contrast depending on, on what you're looking at. But on the low end, um, we're looking between, um, okay, yeah, I think we can break this into low and medium power as well. So on the low end, you're looking at between like a four and about a five and a half or six millimeter egg. So people, even though lots of people's eyes open to about seven, most of the time they're really not going to well, they're not, they're not gonna gain much by going to that extra low power. You're gonna gain field of view. I really enjoy wide fields. As you know, I like to observe wide fields. So I'm always gonna go for those ultra wide fields, but also more and more I've been using sort of like medium high where, or medium low power where I'm into that uh, four to five millimeter angst of pupil uh, because that's where the eye is gonna perform a little bit better. And that's where nebula filters uh, really shine is in around that uh, five millimeter uh, eggs pupil zone. In fact, a lot of people, uh, when they're trying to observe something like the horse head with an H beta for the first time, 
um, they're going to use too low a power, like a seven millimeter exit people um, on a telescope might actually be a little too low and you're going to lose some contrast uh, in just about any telescope to see it, but you pop that uh, power up just a little bit to give you somewhere around a five millimeter exit pupil, and then you're going to be, uh, you're going to be fine. So for example, um, with a F5 instrument, uh, a five millimeter exit pupil means that you're going to need a 25 millimeter eyepiece just to kind of round that back. Now for medium power, medium power is, is pretty specific. So um, I think Roy Bishop has written about this, but it seems to be, and I know Terrence Dickinson favors like around a two or a two and a half millimeter. And again, uh, reading lots and cloudy nights, it seems like the range for the medium power is about a 1.8 millimeter up to and including say around 2.7, 2.8, getting close to a three millimeter. Um, exit people and a lot of people say that this is kind of like the ideal um, happy medium between the low and and the high power and a lot of people will observe in this in this zone so it's kind of interesting I tend to observe more in, in the lower power end of it where the nebula filters work and I like to use nebula filters an awful lot and then still a lot of people will observe in, in that zone and say that uh, well they don't really use the nebula filters as much because they're able to increase the contrast by using slightly more power and the eye works differently uh, when you're using those um, around two to two and a half millimeter exit pupils, give, give or take a little bit. Hmm. Interesting. Fascinating it, stuff, eh? The eye. <laughs> well, and, and, and it, it is a totally different way to think about how you build an eyepiece collection. Um, you know, the reading I've done talks about, um, you know, your maximum power is 50 times per inch of aperture. So if you have a uh, an 80 millimeter telescope, that's about three inches. So the maximum amount of power you would use is 150. But according to exit pupil uh, math that we're just doing right now, your typical 80 millimeter refractor is probably about what, F6 ish, maybe F7. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're not going to get up to that 150 then. No, you're going to be using something in the uh, 82, uh, say, max of around 120. Um, yeah. would be pretty good. And in, in my experience, I get 80 millimeter working at 120. That kind of feels about right, actually. Um, when you do increase the power even more, you're just increasing the size of the object. Of course, some, you know, um, some features are going to stick out a little bit better. But for for a lot of objects, you're you're really going to be losing contrast and actually not be be able to see things as much. And I kind of have noticed this. Like I've never really been a fan of like that super super high power that some people use. I, I like you know, I use my 60 millimeter and F10, so I like the long focal length, um, but, uh, but for other reasons than necessarily achieving high power. Like when I'm observing Venus, which, which is a bad example, I suppose, just super uh, high contrast, but, uh, but once I get up over, much over 100 power, I find that kind of useless and that I definitely get my better results at 100 or, or even like 90 power or something like that in the 60, even though that telescope is capable of, of doing like 150 power or even more. You're just you're just not seeing anymore. In fact, you're you're losing some of, of, uh, of what you could be seeing. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and I think it's one of these cases too, where you really just have to go out there and experiment yourself. Um, you know, to find out probably where you or what range you fall in and where you like to observe. Some people even achieving a one millimeter exit people might be too much. Um, you know, it might be. Uh, at least for comfortable viewing, you might even dial it back further, or maybe you go uh, for more power on top of that. Um, one of the things I always encourage people to do, uh, especially like with anything uh, in astronomy, is just to go out and try things for yourself and, and just see kind of what makes sense for you. Yeah. Anyway, I ju that's just what I've been reading. And if anybody wants to uh, read that article, I just read off the title again. It's called uh, Visual and Photographic Studies of Planets at the Pictomini Observatory by uh, Odwin Dolphus, and it's A-U-I-D-O-U-I-N-D-O-L-L-F-U-S. That's well worth reading. It's long. It's like, a, I think, a 30 or 40 page article. But uh, he was a, a visual professional astronomer, and, and those are uh, relatively rare, especially these days. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because just about everything is done through uh, photography now, or astrophotography, and not even just now. It's been like that for quite a long time for the professionals. So yeah, to have a professional visual observer is extremely rare. 
So that might have been a little advanced for some of our listeners, but you know, it's what I've been doing. Um, but something not so advanced is the Explore the Universe program. Have you, have you ever looked at the RASC uh, Explore the Universe Visual Observing Program, Shane? I have. I haven't, um, you know, I haven't tracked any of my observations against the list, but I have looked at it. Yeah. So the RASC is going to be running an Explore the Universe program via Zoom from June 25th to the end of October. And uh, they were designing it. I've provided some feedback uh, based on the courses that, that I thought it looks pretty good. They have, they have a big crew of people that have been putting in some, some time to kind of get a range. It's not something we've really done before. I'm not really involved in the delivering of it, but uh, I, I know some of the people that are, and they've, they've really spent a lot of time kind of getting it organized. But um, what they're going to do is they're going to go through uh, a lot of the basics of visual observing. Um, there's constellations and they talk about like what constellations are and some of the real basic uh, stuff you need to, to understand the night sky in order to be a successful visual observer. Uh, they're going to go over 24 deep sky objects like galaxies, nebulas that you can actually see in the sky uh, over those months. Uh, and double stars, you were talking about double stars um, for a June observing uh, uh, podcast um, and some planet observations as well as lunar lunar craters. So I don't see the details up yet, but they're going to be published at rasc.ca. And the RASC is a it's a national nonprofit here in Canada. But um, when I was doing some some work uh, a couple weeks ago, we had people joining from all over. It was really great, uh, and I believe it's going to be free to non-members at least this one anyway. So if people are interested in uh, and learning how to do visual observing, um, they should just check out rasc.ca in coming weeks. I think uh, end of the first week or beginning of the second week of June is when they're actually gonna push this out, but they're already kind of sending stuff out to the members. Um, but like I said, I don't know that you have to be a member to do this because that program uh, is not member specific. It's something that uh, that anybody in the world could do. And I know when I was observing chair for, for the RASC, I did send out Lots of observing certificates uh, to all kinds of great, wonderful places in the far reaches of our planet. Oh, very interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Are those evening sessions, do you know, or daytime? They, well, I guess it depends on where you live, but they're going to be, <laughs> yeah. they're going to be at three o'clock um, Eastern time. Uh, Actually, it looks like 2.30 to 4.30 EDT. Oh, did they have them up yet? They weren't up well, yesterday. I see, I see one on June 25th. Okay, yes, that's the start of it. So they're going to do it at 2.30 then. Excellent, that sounds good, Eastern time. So, but what they're going to do is um, they're going to put them online. I think they're going to put them online for free uh, as well. So, but if people kind of want to register and follow along, I think at the end, if you make all the observations, they just send you a certificate. Oh, very nice. You can print off or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And then you can kind of walk through. But during the live Zoom sessions, you can uh, chat with, with people in real time. Or I think you can even like submit questions. Like if you can't make the live sessions and that sort of thing. Um, but again, I believe it's all going to be for free. Like I said, the RISC is a nonprofit organization. And we do uh, public outreach and education. Uh, and you and I have both been members and done a lot of this stuff uh, for a long time. Our podcast is not part of any of that. We just do it on our own for fun without any organization at all. None. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it works, I think. There we go. Good yeah. stuff. All right, Shane. Anything else that uh, we have on the agenda to talk about today? I think that's it. I think we covered off. Uh, well, considering we, we really didn't have an agenda, I think we covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good stuff. Well, it's always great speaking with you. Yeah, it was good. Thank you, Chris. And thanks everybody for listening. Thanks.